So um, I want to get, we're going to start to kick off a series tonight. Uh, it's called uh, Love Thy Neighbor. Or that's the title of tonight's message is Who is My Neighbor? The series title is Who, uh, Love Thy Neighbor. And so there's this thinking within the church, and it comes from the verse, the greatest commandment, which is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. So the great question is, well, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Is my neighbor my neighbor, or is it the person sitting next to me? Is it my family members? Is it my cousins? Is it my friends? Is it who is my neighbor? This is the question we get to dive into today. So we're going to start right off Luke 10, 25 through 37. It's a, it's a significant passage, so we're going to go through it step by step, and I'm going to pause in between. It's going to be fun. Here we go. On one occasion, an expert in the law, so this guy was like smart, he knew the Bible, stood up to test Jesus, not a good idea. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? See, this question right here, what must I do to inherit eternal life, was a question that everyone was so intrigued by because Jesus came saying, the kingdom of heaven is here and I will give you eternal life. And everyone's like, man, what, eternal life? What's this about? It's a concept that today is so foreign, all we can think about is now and the past. We never think about the future, but that's what all Jesus came preaching was the future. So why, why eternal life? How can I get eternal life? In Mosaic Law, how it worked was you had to do all these things in order to inherit eternal life. So you're saying, what, what do I have to do? How can I live forever? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Verse 26, Jesus asks, well, what is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? Verse 27, he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. You see, I think we've been reading... I've been reading this, this, this passage incorrectly my whole, my whole life. I always thought that this, this expert in the law was actually sincere in his questioning. Like, oh, well, what must I do to inherit internal life? Well, who is my neighbor? Or, you know, these questions that he's asking, I thought he was sincere. He was actually testing Jesus, which means he did not have a sincere heart. He was actually trying to catch Jesus in fault so that he could expose him as a liar. Bad idea. Bad idea. So Jesus says, do this, in verse 28, and you will live. Do what, you say? So all you have to do is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's it, and then you can have eternal life. That's all you have to do. <laughs> it's like, what? That's all? That's, that's a pretty tall order to fill. Verse 29, but he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus. He wanted to justify himself, meaning he wanted to puff, he wanted to make himself look a little better, like a little more spiritual, like a little more like he's got it going on. So he said, and, and who, is my, who is my neighbor? Like maybe elbow in his butt. Who is my neighbor? Let's see what he says here. <laughs> Man, and Jesus just take these, oh my God. He just, just floors these guys with his answers. But he wasn't asking it out of sincerity. He was asking it to try to prove something to God, to prove something to Jesus, and to prove something to everyone who was listening. Verse 30. So who is my neighbor? Who is it that you're talking about that I'm supposed to love as myself? Verse 30. In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. It's important to note here. So he was going from Jerusalem to Jericho. This is a roughly a 20-mile hike, 20-mile ride, and it's, very, it's a very dangerous road. It, you see, it goes from a high eleva elevation to a low elevation, so it's very mountainous, a lot of hills, cliffs, 
Very dangerous. And not only that, it's historically known as a place where thieves, robbers, bad guys like to hang out. So when people were traveling on this road alone, they would come, attack them, beat them up, steal their stuff, leave them for dead. It was historically known as that. So Jesus was taking that into account when he's telling them this. So a man was going from Jerusalem to Jericho. He was attacked by robbers, left half for dead. Verse 31. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. The priest, the priest, <sighs> Jesus knows what he's doing. The priest is the man who, who should be the one helping him. He's the godly man. He's the man who knows the Bible he's, or the, the scriptures. He's the man who knows everything. He's the man who knows God. So certainly he would help this man who was dying, but he didn't. He says he walked right by. And remember, he's talking to an expert in the law. He's talking to a priest. And Nick and I were talking about this before. We were talking, and this this is just my own thinking. But could it be that Jesus brought this story up hypothetically, but this expert in the law has done this very thing? Maybe, just maybe, this guy walked by someone on that road, walked right by him. So Jesus is saying, hey, there's a hypothetical story, but he's saying... You, this is you, man. So a priest happening to go right, went by, right by the other side, walked right past him. 30, verse 32. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and he saw him, passed by on the other side. Levite is basically, he's a, he's a priest, but he's kind of like the priest that's uh, lower on the totem pole. Not as significant in their culture. But still, still he knew God, he knew the scriptures, and yet he walked right by. Man, left naked, half dead, about to die, just walks right by. Well, you say, why would the Levite walk by? Why wouldn't he just do something? Historically, what they would do, what the Levite might have known is, is the, the robbers, the bad guys who were, who were beating people up, they would set, up, set people up so they would have somebody on the ground faking as though they were dead, and then when they would come to help him, they would attack and they would hurt him. And so he's like, man, I've seen that before. My buddy Billy, yeah, man, he, he tried to help someone. He got jumped. I ain't helping that dude. I'm going to walk right by. <laughs> so I asked myself, what would I have done if I saw that man? If I'm honest, I would have walked by. Most time, I would have walked right by. Why would I? For convenience sake. It's inconvenient to, to help somebody who's dying. It's inconvenient to, to go out of my way. I have a destination. But then we have a third guy who walks by, and you know this guy. He's called the Good Samaritan, verse 33, but a Samaritan. But what you need to know is that Jesus was talking to an expert in law, a Jew, and a Samaritan was like the enemy of the Jews. He was an enemy. He was like the last guy he wanted to be associated with with a Samaritan. And we see this when he was at the well. He talked to a Samaritan woman and she said, well, Jesus, why are you talking to me? So we have this clash of interest. We have a Jew and we have a Samaritan clashing. And Jesus knows what he's doing, so he brings up the Samaritan on purpose. It wasn't like, oh, I'll just choose a Samaritan. No, he knew what he was saying. Continue in verse 33. As he traveled came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him, or he had compassion on him. He went, to him. he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Verse 35. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Just to give you an idea, two denarii is, in today's world, it would be roughly be $150 to $200. Verse 36, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who, or 36, which of these do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So this man wants to know how to get eternal life. So he tells him about this man who has mercy on him. And so when he's asking him, who is my neighbor, what it tells me is that this guy thought he loved the Lord with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength. He was saying, yeah, I got that covered. I got that love and the God thing. Yeah, that's already done, but who's my neighbor? Because if I can love my neighbor 
and I can love God, then I can have eternal life. And this is what Jesus said. Jesus says, you know those guys? You know those guys that you hate? You know those guys that you can't stand being around? I want you to go and love them. He said, I want you to go not have and love them. I want you to take the most inconvenient one. I want you to take the one that nobody else, I want you to take the one that is so inconvenient and I want you to pick him up. I want you to rip your clothes and, and patch up his wounds. I want you to go and I want you to put him on his donkey. Then I want you to take him to an inn and I, then I want you to pay $200, two days worth of work to help save that man's life. If you do that every day for every single person that you ever come across to, then you can have eternal life. You see, I don't think Jesus was actually telling him the way to eternal life. I think he was, he was exposing his motive. Because we know that the only way to eternal life is through faith in Jesus Christ. So I was thinking that this contradiction between, okay, then how do we have eternal life? Jesus was telling him, man, what Jesus wanted to hear from him is, I can't do that. I can't, I can't love everyone that I come in contact like that. I can't love every single person in the world with all of my heart like that. I can't do it. I'm unable to. That's what Jesus was looking for. He was looking for someone to say, you know what? I'm my own ability. I cannot do it. I cannot keep the law. I cannot do all the things that you want me to do, so I need someone who could do it for me to take my place. And that's what he was looking for. <laughs> So Jesus told him, go and do likewise. And then it just ends. It doesn't say anything like after that. Which tells me this guy was floored. He was, man. Either one, he took it to heart. I guess we can hope that he changed. Or two, he said, man, that guy doesn't know what he's talking about. And he left. Go and do likewise. So go back to the question, who is my neighbor? Who is our neighbor? Let's look at what Jesus' standards. So this is, this is straight out of Jesus' standards, right? So our neighbor is someone who is in pain, who we shouldn't be seen with socially, who's inconvenient to love, who's helpless, who's in great need, a continual follow-up, because he said, hey, I'll come back, and if, if it costs any more, I'll pay you that much. I'll pay it to you. It's continual. It's not a one-time thing. That's why I love the Dream Center. They go back every week. So I'll be here next week. I'll be here next week. It's not just this like, and I, I'm all about this. I'm all about showing love to people, but the guys, the homeless guys in the corner, it's not like, hey, man, here's, here's 10 bucks. God, I did my one thing for the day. Our neighbors are the ones who, without the love of God, we would walk right past. And I'll tell you what the most dangerous place to be in is. And I've been there, and I have to check myself all the time. The most dangerous place to be is when you know you're supposed to do something and you ignore it. It's when you feel the tugging on your heart to do something, to go the extra mile. And we ignore it. Because every time we ignore it, we become more insensitive to that tugging. But every time we obey it, we become more sensitive to it. <laughs> I'll tell you who our neighbor is not. Not that we shouldn't love these people. <laughs> but our neighbor is not our best friend. Our neighbor is not the person that we like to hang around. Our neighbor is not someone we get along with. Our neighbor is not someone who we enjoy being around. See, the Jews thought my neighbor was a fellow Jew. That was historically, culturally, that was like the norm. So Jesus said, nope, wrong. Your neighbor is your worst enemy. Man. This is so much different than the way we think. It's so, much, it's so contrary to our natural instincts. Matthew 5, 46 through 47. <laughs> if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, 
What are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. If you love those who love you, what reward? It's not hard for me to love my wife. because she. It's not hard for me to love Greg because I see his heart. And it's just easy because he's, it's reciprocal. It's not hard for me to love Andrew. It's not hard for me to love these people who are, who are on the same track, same path. We're, you know, we're walking on the same road. It's not hard for me to do that. Because here's the reality. If you look at very violent gangs who would say have a lot of hatred in their hearts towards other people. (laughs) They still love each other. They still love each other. The most evil people in the world who come together, (laughs) they love each other. They greet each other. They'll die for each other. But what's the difference with Christians? What's the difference with us? The only, other, the only religion that can say this is that we have a model in Jesus Christ who loved his enemies. We were his enemies. And he set the model and he said, listen guys, follow me, follow me and we'll shake up the whole earth because all the other world loves their own, but we're gonna love who nobody else loves. And that's how we're gonna be set apart. Matthew 5, 16 says, let your light shine, so shine. See your good works so that they may glorify your Father in heaven. We are not saved by good works, but our, the love we receive from Jesus Christ just leads us to them. <sighs> Let's go. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for apologizing. <laughs> Jesus responds uh, very interestingly to, to this man. And I, and I caught this and I was like, what the hell? What's going on here? So the man asked in the, in, the, in the beginning of the verse, he says, who is my neighbor? Verse 36, Jesus says, who was a neighbor? Which tells me one thing. Jesus is, not, Jesus is not in the business about talking. He's not in the business about arguing who is a neighbor. He's in the business of being. He's in the business of transforming into being a neighbor. So we want to be a neighbor. We want to be a Christ follower, someone who's a neighbor as described in the parable of the Good Samaritan. I want to be that person. And I know you want to be this person else you wouldn't be here. So, first thing a neighbor is, a neighbor is compassionate. They see a situation from God's perspective. They see a person, not the problem. They see an opportunity, not an inconvenience. They are moved by what is moving God's heart They see potential, not problems. That's what a neighbor is. Think about the Good Samaritan man. The first thing that says in the verse, it says, he saw. Man, isn't it funny how he saw a different thing than the priest? And he saw a different thing than the Levite? He saw. He saw a dead man. And he says he took pity on him or he had compassion compassion on him. And there's a word inside compassion that I just love. It's passion. Compassion is not the, oh, come here, I have compassion on you. Compa- compassion is passionate. And what it, it's compassionate about is restoring the thing it's compassionate for. Does that make sense? So the thing that it's passionate about is restoring the thing it's compassionate for. So he saw the man dead, and he took he had compassion on him, so he was moved to change something in the situation. See, we confuse sympathy with compassion. Sympathy is feeling bad for someone. Oh, man, tough luck. I'm sure the priest and the Levite had sympathy on him, but it was only the Samaritan who had compassion on him because compassion moves us to action. Compassion without action is sympathy. So are we going to be a compassionate people or are we going to be a sympathetic people? 
Are we going to be those who talk about and, and who, yeah, we feel bad for those people, but uh, yeah, <laughs> glad I'm not over there. Or are we going to be people who say, you know what, I feel for them, and I'm passionate about doing something about it. Passionate. Here's the thing, though. Matthew 9, 14 and 20, I'll talk about Jesus and how he had compassion on people. And he was always busy. He was always an inconvenience to him because he, want, he wanted to be with the Father. He wanted to be with God in communion. And the people were like, no, Jesus, we need you, we need you. And it says, multiple t- time after time after time, it said, and Jesus had compassion on him, on them, on the people. And he healed their sicknesses and he healed their diseases. And the act of, of being a neighbor is always preceded by a reflection on how much God loves us. The act of loving is always preceded by realizing how much we're loved first. Because we cannot love our neighbors unless we love ourselves correctly. It says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And sadly, there are some people in the world who don't love themselves, so how are they ever supposed to love their neighbor? And the reason why I love myself is because I realize how much he loves me. So if we get that perspective of how much he loves us, it compels us to love other people. Because we start seeing from a different perspective, we start seeing from heaven's view. And it compels us to action. Second thing, a neighbor is practical, not positional. The priest was the holy one. The Levite was the, was the holy one. They were the pastor. They were the Bible teacher. They did nothing. And I, can, and I can tell you right now, I sit up here and I listen to stories from people who are here of what they're doing in our communities. And I say, God, I need to catch up with them. Because there's... Because they realize that it's not about a position, it's about being practical. It's about doing, not not having a title. It's about being and not coming. Let me explain that. So the Samaritan was, he 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 wasn't a Christian. He didn't know Jesus. He didn't know anything. They they, they didn't follow religion. They didn't follow God. They were were Gentiles. But God uses him and says he he knew the love of God. So it's not the pastors, it's not, the, it's not us up here who have it all figured out. Because God's saying, if we, if we come and we, somebody comes up to us and, and they, they need to talk and we listen to them and we help them and we encourage them, yeah, it's a good thing, but, and, I, and I love doing it, and I love hearing people's hearts, I love helping, but it's my job. And so if I never take it outside the confines of my job, I'm not a neighbor. If we never take it outside the walls, I'm sorry, but it's all in vain. <laughs> so until I take it outside of my position, that I actually become a neighbor. And there's a lie that gets twisted in people's li- uh, minds that says, I can't do that until I become this. I can't do that until I have know this many scriptures, or if I know I memorize this many scriptures, or until I get rid of this sin in my life, or until I get this figured out in my life, or until I restore this relationship, or until I stop doing this. We trick ourselves into thinking we need a position before we start being practical. And we can't. It has to start, and it has to be fueled by compassion. Compassion needs no title. The Samaritan was moved by compassion. He was not moved by obligation. He was compassionate, he was available, he was willing. Until our compassion has action, we'll live our lives through all of life's distractions. We'll always distract ourselves with other things. We'll always distract ourselves with this and say, oh, well, I'm just busy, I'm just busy, I can't do that. Oh, I gotta be here, so I'm just not gonna stop and help that person. Oh, I'm too busy watching Netflix. Yeah, I needed to catch up on that series. <laughs> Compassion and action. A religious neighbor 
will talk about loving people. They'll know the right words and the right verses about loving people. But a true neighbor will almost do no talking and will just love. A true neighbor doesn't need to defend themselves and measure up to how much they're loving. A true neighbor just does it. A true neighbor will just love people. Sometimes I go through life and, and I want to help someone. I want to help someone, but I just I talk myself out of it. I talk myself out of it. And then I get convicted of, man, I should have done that. But something God showed me is that when, 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 when he convicts you of what you didn't do, he's always going to show you how much potential you still have. He's never going to remind you of the past without showing you a brighter future. See, what the devil wants you to do is think about the past, discourage yourself so you never do it again. But God wants you to say, okay, man, because sometimes I'll sit and, and I'll say, you know, he'll remind me, say, you missed it. And I'm like, dang it. But then he'll show, he'll, he'll show me, he'll say, oh, man, but look ahead of you. Look ahead of you. Look ahead of you. That's not stopping my future for you. It's not stopping it for you. So we cannot let our past mistakes define our future successes. 1 Corinthians 4.20. I love this verse. It's like one of my favorites in the whole Bible. 1 Corinthians 4.20. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. You guys, let's stop. I, I pro, I'm going to stop. I stop. I'm going to stop talking about loving people. I'm going to stop. I'm, just, I'm going to start doing it. Is anyone with me? I'm glad I got some crazy people in here. I'm done talking about it. Third thing a neighbor is, a neighbor is committed. Man, the Samaritan bandaged the man, put him on his donkey, took him to the inn. Man, he took care of him. He was committed to him. He wasn't like a one and done. He was committed He's committed to the well-being, and true neighbor is committed to the well-being of those who are around him. Matthew 25, 40. I love this verse. This verse. I love a lot of verses. The king will reply, Jesus, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Here's the perspective shift. We have to start, we have to start, we have to start seeing people, not as people. We have to start seeing people for what God sees them. And what he sees them as potential, he sees them as purpose, he sees them as destiny. If we just got the, every single, I'm looking at every single person, I'm saying, man, everything I do for you is I'm doing for God. Because God's in you. God's made you. And so when I do it for you, I do it for him. And when we do it for the least of these, we're not doing it in vain. We're doing it for our king. Man, we do it for the least of these. When no one's looking, Jesus says, you did it for me. It says early in this verse, he says, you clothed me when I was, when I was naked. You fed me when I was hungry. And we're going to ask, when did we clothe you? When did we feed you? And he says, when you did it for the least of these, you did it for me. A neighbor is committed. So I have a story about my friend, Nathan. You heard me talk about him before. He lives in Tennessee. He's a pastor down in Tennessee. And this was before, this was a couple years ago, but he, he told me about this guy. He, he saw a homeless guy on the side of the road, and he just said, hey, man, get in. I'll go get you some food. So he hopped in the car, took him to McDonald's. And... He bought him food, got to know him, heard his story, and just said, man, I, I want to help you out. So he said, next week, this time, I'll be right here. I'll come, and I'll be here. I'll pick you up, and we'll go get some more food. He came back the next week, picked him up, got him food, talked to him again, talked to him again. Next week, came back, same thing. Next thing you know, he has this relationship with this guy, and this guy's opening up to him. And my details might be a little off because it's been a while since I heard the story. But he continually poured into the guy, and eventually, and eventually he, stopped, he stopped showing up. But he was committed to him, man. He came. It wasn't like a one and done. It was like over and over and over again. Man, I'll be here. I'll be here. I'll be here. I'll be here. 
That's inspiring to me. It makes me think, man, I can do that. All it takes is a little, a little intentionality. Story, I mean, I, God's just so good. I mean, he lines everything up so perfectly, it just amazes me. I was talking to Bobby, and he didn't even know what I was talking about, and he was talking about a guy that he was, he went downtown, he tried to meet up with Deontay's group United, but he missed him, and so he's just like, I'm going to walk around downtown. So he saw a guy, he saw a homeless guy that he had met weeks before, and he said, hey man, how you doing? And he, and he talked to him, he's like, man, I really need some, I really need some stuff, I really need some hygiene products, because I stink, and I need it. And Bobby's like, sorry man, I don't, all the stores are closed. It was like 9 o'clock. I, don't, I can't get you anything right now. He said, well, you just give me some cash. Bobby's like, I don't have cash. But Bobby said, I'll come back tomorrow. And I'll bring it for you. So he comes back tomorrow. And he's, he's looking all over for this guy. Bobby's looking all over. He can't find him. Can't find him. All of a sudden, Bobby's like, man, I should probably pray and ask if God will show me where he is. He says he prays for him. He goes, God, show me where this guy is. Show me where he is. He opens his eyes. And he said, not but five seconds later, he walked right across in front of him. And he goes up to him, he has a whole bag full of stuff, and he says, here you go, man. And he got him some hygiene products, and this guy likes to clean the, the, tire, or the rims on, on cars so that he can try to earn some money. And so he bought him some, some cloth, and he bought him some tire shining spray. And he said, here, I just want to bless you, man. And the guy, and I love what Bobby's response was. He said, the guy was like, thank you, thank you, thank you. And Bobby said, man, I don't, I'm not doing this because I love you. I'm doing this because God loves you. See, the only reason I'm doing this is because God loves me and so I love you. The only reason is because of God. The only reason because of God, it's God, God, God. It's not because I was like, I want to make myself feel better. No, it's because the love of God compels us into good works. It compels us into loving people. And I love that story because it's so simple and it could change that man's life. He bought him some, some hot, all he had to do was go to the store, buy some deodorant, buy some hand sanitizer, whatever else he bought him, and go back and give it to him and say, God loves you. He was committed. He came back the next day. And I know Bobby's going to continue to keep his eye out for this guy so he can pour more of the love of God on him. So there's a lot of talk, right? I said I was done talking, but I could talk some more. Talking about love is doing. Doing. And I, we want to give you opportunities to act. We want to give you opportunities because I understand that some people, when I, when I first started going out and, and evangelizing and sharing the gospel to people, it was very scary to me. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to do. So what really helps is when you have like a ministry that you can plug into, when you have a group of people who are committed to it already and who have already done it, who can teach you how to associate and how to get along and how to talk to people who you don't know. One of those groups I want to connect you with and, and give you an opportunity to, to find out more information on is United. Deontay, would you stand up? United. Who goes, who's been here, who's been united here? Amazing. What they do is they go downtown on Tuesday nights, they partner with Degage, which is a homeless ministry, right? And they go, and they just, and they just love people. They just walk around, they pray for people, they walk around, they just talk to people, they walk around, and they, they bring food to them sometimes, they, have a, they hold events for people, they, and they go out, and they just walk around. And they do equipping events where they teach you how to approach people that you don't know in a confident way, in a normal way. Thanks, Deanta. Yeah, you can sit down. <laughs> so they, they're equipping people to do this. If that interests you, I strongly encourage you to connect with him and start getting plugged in this on Tuesday nights from 5.30 to 8.00. Because what can happen is we can get so scared that we do nothing. But when you, when you connect with a ministry like United or Dream Center, you start to get practice and you start to get some more confidence. So when you're in your real life, you're more confident to do something that's outside of your comfort zone because you have some practice in it. And that's the purpose behind it. We talked about our vision last week, how we're committed to equipping you. We're committed to, to strengthening your faith so that you can go make a difference in your everyday life. Another thing is Dream Center. Saturdays, we talked about it. Get connected in these things so you can start strengthening and becoming more comfortable in spreading the news of Jesus Christ and talking to people who need the love of God. John 13, 34 through 35. I'm going to end with this. A new command I give you. 
love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This is what this is saying. The world will know that we follow Christ by how well we love each other. The world will know that we're Christians by how well we love our neighbors. The world will know we're, will know we're Christians by how much we love. The world does not know how, much, how we're Christians by our church attendance. We are not known by our scripture memorization. We are not known by our friend groups, social groups. We are known. We will be known by how we love each other. That's the only way. No other way. So we need to start getting plugged in to loving one another. Dream Center. United. Leah does faith and fitness. There's, there's things that we can plug in so it becomes more normal for us, so it, so it starts becoming more comfortable for us so that we can do it in our everyday life. So I said it, but I'm going I'm to say it one more time. The goal for teaming up is so that we can go out. The goal for teaming up is not to fulfill your day, or weekly obligations to love somebody. It's to equip you to, so when you're at your work, when you're at your job, when you're at the gas station, when you're at Meijer, you are equipped to do something. You are equipped to love. That's why we're partnering with them. Because the world doesn't need more ministries. The world needs more ministers. It needs more of you in your daily life. Because if we're known by our ministries, there's an on and off switch. Ministry, and it's 8 o'clock, we're done. Okay, promise this is where we're going to end. I want you to look around. And I want you to make eye contact, eye contact with some people who maybe you don't know. Just look around. And when you're looking around, I want you to think about this. The person that you're looking at has so much more potential than you can ever imagine. Look around. Dylan, you're not looking at anyone. <laughs> I'm just messing. Look around. Seriously, the people, that we're, the people in this room have so much more potential than we can ever imagine. You have more potential than you can ever imagine. You have more potential, Dylan, than you can ever imagine. You, Joe, have more potential than you can ever imagine. You, Josiah, you, Tavon, you, Joseph, you have more potential than you can ever imagine. And that's where we need to start. Seeing other people. It's the people that we're loving or have more potential than we could ever imagine. I just want you to bow your heads, close your eyes as we, as we close here. If you're here and you've never made Jesus Lord of your life, if you never said, I believe that Jesus is my Lord, my Savior, I declare that I will live for him forever. If you've never done that, we don't want to leave you without an opportunity tonight. So if that's you and you say, man, all this talk about love, I'm just like kind of, it's just kind of confusing me, but it sounds good and I want to partake. I want to be a part of it. I want to be a part of, of a life that's so consumed with purpose. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. Awesome. Awesome. If that's you, after service, I need you. It's important. No options. Come up to the front and talk to one of our prayer partners. We have people who are equipped to, to talk to you and to listen to you and to lead you into a place where, we can, where you can receive, or receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So I'm just going to pray it out. Dear God, I thank you for how good you are. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your love that compels us to love other people. I thank you that we are your body, that we are your answer to the world, and that we, through the love of Christ, can love the world well, and that we will be known by how well we love. We will be known as people who follow Jesus Christ. I thank you for the destiny and the purpose of every single person in this room, and that you are showing them their purpose. You're showing them how much they are loved so that they can be a difference to the world around them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to this series. For more information, call 616-534-4923 or visit us at reslife.org.